see if this mic's working now. Is that the board? Testing. 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 Good morning. Testing, testing, testing. You know, have you thought about, uh, it sounds now, have you thought about just using another slot? We got about what, 60 slots up there? Good morning, everyone. I was St. Joseph. If you're able, please stand for our opening. We're standing on holy ground.
so good to be in the house of God again. And God has truly blessed us. And now he is calling us to worship. It is understood, everything that we do at St. Joseph in worshiping God is all biblical. Everything is biblical. And in the Bible, uh, when Isaiah was being called as a prophet and God was working with him, what he found out is that it is God who calls us to worship. We think that we are, even though we set the time and say we're going to worship at 11 o'clock. You know, all that's good. But God takes that into, in, into consideration. He looks at that. But even still, it is he who calls us and says, I give you permission to worship me. And so at this moment, it is recognized that, that God is calling us to worship. Now, the other thing that he wants us to understand when he does that is that while we worship him, he, God, not us, he is holding demons and Satan and all that's evil. He's holding that at bay. He is the one who keeps Satan out of our way, who frees us so that we can freely worship him. We don't have to bind no devils so we can worship him. We don't have to kick any of them out. We don't have to do any of that. We worship him with the freeness of our hearts and knowing that God is doing all of that. And so as we, we come now to worship, uh, uh, let, let, let us be reminded in our hearts that this, this is a time for worship. This is a time that God is calling us into this worship. And God wants us to focus our minds and our hearts on him. James chapter 4 verse 7 tells us that we should, first of all, submit ourselves unto God. And then secondly, when we free ourselves un unto God, we resist the devil. That's what we do. We resist him. We don't bind him. We don't talk to him. We don't fight him. We don't throw him out the building. We resist him. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, God says then through his scriptures that Satan must flee. He cannot stay in the presence. And so when we are truthful in our hearts that we are submitting ourselves now unto God as we are about to go into worship and we are resisting any of the evilness that would come about to attack us, then God says he is true, he is righteous to cause Satan to flee from our midst. L let us pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we lift our hands in humble submission to your will we resist the devil and by the power of your Holy Spirit we ask that you would cause Jesus to magnify himself in our midst amen
bless his holy name. You may be seated. Bless his name. Amen. All right. All right you want to come up and do the... All right, sir. Amen. It is now time for our intercessory prayer. As I read the names, just pray to yourselves for those that you know they need you yourself. They may not be on this list, but you know they're in prayer. Amen. Amen. Micah Sean Boltwright. Sister Alberta Bowden. Sister Carolyn and DeAndre Campbell. Marcus Campbell. Sister Kay Carroll. Children's Youth Department Ministry. Cora Clayton. And Deacon Rodney Collins and family. And Daryl Cole. Denise Cooley and family. Master Trey Crocker, Pastor Richard and Teresa Curry and family, Blanche Day and family, Inez Butler Drain, Preston and Bernice Drummer, Sister Otha Frazier, Brother Otis Glover, Brother Ivory Godwin, Shirley Green, Sister Michelle Grooms, Antonio, Stephanie, and Leonard Hackley. Brother Willie and Sister Corey Hackley, Sister Holton and family, Vanetta Jackson, the jail ministry, Takaya Jones and family, Ernest Morrell, Jefferson and Pearson family, and Brother Ronald Leach, Brother James LeCount, Brother Adrian and Stanley Limbrick, Antoinette Lovely and family, Sister Phyllis Luckett, Tondalee Manley, Brother Larry McKenzie, Brother Terry and Sister Daphne Mitchell, Brother Terry and Sister Ariana Mitchell the third, Sister Hilda Myers, Brother D'Angelo Parker, Daisha Peterson, Brother Bentley and Brother Nathaniel Porter, Tia Reed and family, Sister Brenda Sapp, Sister Bertha Scott, Jimmy Simmons, Deacon Marvin Simmons Sr., Carmen Small, Jared Smith, Deacon Ralph Smith, Katrilla, Darrell, and Shalithia Stringfield, Brother Michael, Chikari, Tony, and Trey Sutton, Sister Valencia Sutton, Lois Teller, Brother Bobby Tucker Jr., Brother Quentin Wallace and family, Bobby Williams, Brother Bobby Wright and family, Linda Wright, Travis Wright and family, and Phyllis Drumfield. Let's keep them all lifted in prayer as well as we solicit our prayers to our Lord. Bow your heads with me as we go to this altar. Father, we just say thank you. Father, first we thank you, Lord Jesus, for allowing us to acknowledge we need you to survive. Father, we say thank you. We thank you, Lord, for giving us the victory. Father, but sometimes our trials can seem so overcoming that we can't see on the other side. But Father, we say thank you for our provider. We say thank you for our healer. We say thank you for our way maker. We say thank you because in the depth of our unworthiness, Father, you delivered, you delivered us. Father, you took your son to Calvary. Father, he died just for us. And Lord, we say thank you. Father, whatever your will be for our lives, Lord, we say thank you. Lord, we don't have enough tongues to say thank you, so we're going to exercise our right just to say thank you. Father, our families are going through so much turmoil and trials and tribulations, Lord, but we know, Lord, as long as we stay steadfast in your word, Father, that you've already seen us through. Not will, but you already have. And Lord, we just say thank you. We know things get hard. We know finances get a little tight, but we say thank you. Father, it wouldn't be a problem if we can see our way out, but thank God we're leaning and depending on you standing on your promise knowing Lord that you will never leave us 
nor forsake us. Father, we thank you for our pastor, his wife, his family. Father, we thank you for a man of God that you've blessed us with that will teach, teach, and teach even more. Love the flock that you gave him. Father, we just bless you for him. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for St. Joseph individually and collectively. Everybody on the prayer list, everybody that's not on the prayer list, Father, we ask that you will keep your protective hedge around us, Lord. Keep us grounded and rooted in your word. Father, let us study to show thyself approved because the wickedness that we face each and every day, Father, from the household to outsiders that we don't even know, Father, lead us and guide us. Lord, we love you. Father, we thank you. In Jesus' name, we all say. In Jesus' name, we all say. Knowing that you delivered us. In Jesus' name, we all say. Amen and praise the Lord. Song. 
faithful, loving service to who him belong. Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help. Love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help. Love me. completely say he will lift you by his love out of the angry way he's the master of the sea billows his will obey he your savior wants to be be saved today love lifted me love lifted me when nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Thank you. Amen. If you can, turn your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. And as I just proofread the scripture, I said to myself, Pastor finna get us again. Pastor say just teaching, but I say he gonna get us. <laughs> he wanna he wanna whip whip us in shape. Amen. Amen. Ain't nothing wrong with that. When you get there by signify saying Amen, please. Amen. Y'all ready for this word? For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be we shall also in the likeness of of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth he, we, should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. <clears throat> For in that he died. He died unto sin once. But in that he liveth. He liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves. To be dead indeed unto sin but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen, amen, and amen. Get your notes and your pads and your phones. Get them together. Amen.
my light in darkness. Thank you, Father. God is my all.
I didn't know that you could sing like that. I'm telling you. Yeah. There, 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 is, there is a TV series that used to come on that was called In the Heat of the Night. There was an officer, a female officer, Lou Ann Corbin was her character name, that could sing, boy, just like you. Yeah, the, the, I don't know how you express it. The, uh, there's a fullness, a throatiness, a, I don't know how to put it in your voice. That's beautiful, it projects beautifully. And it, it reminded me of, of her, you know. So, oh, bless you, bless you. God bless you, mm, bless you. I thank God for what he's doing in St. Joseph, I'm telling you, everywhere around, he's just causing his presence to be recognized among us, and that's what it's about. Loving God, loving man, loving the fellowship, being able to grow within the fellowship. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, God, that you saw fit to bless us. And now, God, we, we come to this moment of worship to where we preach and teach your word to your people. Pray now that you would, uh, would bless and that you would truly just uh, wrap your arms around us as you forgive us and prepare us now to not only preach your word, but to hear what you have to say. Bless us today. For this is our prayer in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Give an honor to God, to our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and to his Holy Spirit. We come blessing you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know of no other name that can be lifted that has any benefit in our life that moves us to strength, to be taught, to be guided, or anything else. It's, it's, it's Jesus. It's all about him. It's all about what he does in our life. Not about our abilities. We're not able to do anything. We are still as no good in this flesh as we were the day we met him. But praise be to God, he has done something in us to where we are most precious in his sight. To when God the Father looks at us, he sees his son Jesus. And that's a beautiful thing, my brothers and sisters. That's a beautiful thing. And that's why God has, has moved us in teaching and, and his word, in, in, in really equipping the saints. See, sometimes we, we get this all backwards. We think that the, uh, uh, the pastor uh, is to stand up and to preach sermons to save souls. No. That may shock some of you, but no, that's not what we are called to do. That's not what we are called to do. Jesus says it is his job, it is the Holy Spirit's job to save souls. It is our job, if we are going to be doing any speaking or preaching or teaching, is for those that have already been saved by the touching power of the Holy Spirit to recognize that there's something different that has happened in their lives and yield their lives to Jesus. But it is never our job to be saving souls. Jesus says to us, and the only commission he's given us is to make disciples. Make disciples. So when we come to church, the Bible tells us we come to church for a couple of things. One, to praise God for who he is and what he's done in our lives. That's, that, that's, that's, that's one. But the second reason we come is to be equipped. And you are equipped by being taught. So when the pastor stands up, it is his job to be teaching, to equip you, to strengthen you, not to throw fire and hailstone on your heads. It is not ever to, you know, to threaten you with the, with the, with the place of hell because you are children of God. 
If you are here today and you are calling yourself a church member, you're calling yourself a Christian, you're saying that you're born again, then there's no need for me to stand up here and preach fire and brimstone to you. But I need to stand up here and teach you how to live when you walk out that door to represent, no, I won't say, no, even while you're in here. Let's don't start walking out the door while you're in here. How to be Christians and how to love each other and how to love God. That's what my job is, is, is to do, you know. So I, 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 I've heard some comments, you know, he don't, he don't ever preach a sermon that's leading people to Christ or whatever. I, you ever heard me preach at funerals? In other sessions, that's my main thing because I know there they ain't all Christians. You know, my, my main part of my sermon is to comfort the hearts of the people, but to throw in while they are not looking, you know, a way to salvation, a way to, to get their lives right with Christ. You know, so so don't don't get caught up in the in the hoopla. You know, don't get caught up in the idea that I'm not up here hooping and dancing and throwing, you know, rocks out at you and, and doing all this kind of stuff. I'm here to teach you. The Bible says to equip you. That's my job. Because you're already claimed to be born again. Now, if there's some of you that's in here that ain't saved, so that nobody else will know it, come to my office and uh, let me know so I can, I'll start to preaching some Get, you know, get saved messages to kind of help you out. But short of that, we're here to teach you what it means and how to be Christians. There are children that are here, and they listen to about maybe one piece of what I'm saying. But you know what? That one piece of what I'm saying will follow them all of their lives. I think back when I was a little kid back in Ronald Rapids, you know, church on the, on the creek you know, by the graveyard. And uh, my mind was more on what the girls were looking like than what the preacher was doing. But I'm telling you something, little bit of stuff I caught that stayed, that's still in my spirit, that I remember this day, which are many, 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 sincere, many, many, many years ago. <laughs> You know, when I be filling out forms, you know, on the computer or on the phone, and they say, you know, choose your birth year. It used to be, it was just easy to do. Now I got to roll and roll and roll and roll and roll. <laughs> I'm saying, my goodness, you know. <laughs> you know. You all are such a beautiful people. I love the laughter that says to me that God is just blessing your, your heart, your spirit. And that's what's so important. This morning, I want to talk to you about something. And it's dealing with the power of sin. It's dealing with the power of sin, but the topic is going to be death to the power of sin. But giving honor also to the preachers that are on the podium with me, Reverend uh, Simon, and the reason I say preachers is because uh, Reverend Brown, I mean, in spirit, he's here. He lets me know where he is and why he's not here, and you know, he's very faithful in being checking in. And so I recognize his spirit sitting right there with us, you know, every time that we come together. So give an honor to him in the presence of his, his spirit. To the choir, and again, what a beautiful song and a beautiful rendition of it. Bless you, bless you, bless all of you. Look at Miss Tina. Hey, darling, how you doing? Doing fine? Oh, look at you, look at you. God bless you, darling, God bless you. To the organist, God bless you. And to the, yeah, the drum player, she, she hides out. I have to look for her. To the director and all that are involved in, in the music. The deacons of this church, 
deaconesses, to the multimedia ministry, to the ushers, to the nurses, Gil, bless you, to, uh, to, to all of you, even to uh, uh, my bodyguard sitting up there. You know, that's what he says, you know, don't, 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 don't come near the pastor with your hand still in your pocket. <laughs> he is a, a loving brother, I'm telling you. And also, I have to always lift up our, our, our treasurer, you know. You, know I, I, it, you, you can't, by the bylaws, pay them any money because whatever is rendered by the, the officers of this church are not allowed to receive funds. If I could, I would be paying them guys, I'm telling you, I would. They are worth every bit of it, you know. Thank you, Brother Leroy. Bless you, my friend, bless you. And to you, St. Joseph, my family, I love every one of you. I love every single one of you. And I pray that you love me back. Yeah, and I pray that you do. Mm. And then to my family, sitting up there in the, in the balcony, and to my darling wife. What a support she is. Bless her. Bless her. She is so sweet. The older she gets, the prettier she gets, man. I'm telling you, find you a woman that way. You know what? If you find a girl that you're going to get serious with, go meet her mama or her grandmama. If they still pretty, that means that there's a big chance that the girl that you're going to hook up with, you know, will have. I'm just messing, guys. I'm just, I'm just messing. I know ain't no truth in all of that. <laughs> hey, <laughs> trying to toll him, huh? <laughs> all right. You're, oh, well, the Lord will bring it to you. Don't rush it, man. You're still young. Still young. Got a lot of life in front of you. I'm doing great. I guess you guys can tell I'm just rambling and just enjoying myself. You know, I really, you know, this is a time I really get to enjoy being a pastor. You know, this is no work whatsoever. The work is during the weekdays. You know, this is, this is celebration. This is enjoyment. And uh, I, I just bless you all for that. But, you know, in that blessing, there's some things that I want to share with you today to show how blessed you are being a child of God. We look around at the world so much and receiving the attacks of the world so much Sometimes we think that God is overlooking us, that, uh, that, that, that we're worse off than the devil's children. Because when we look over there, we see them progressing. We're seeing like they're just, just, just growing in statue and, and prosperity, and, and we are struggling along. But we need to start to looking truly at what God is doing and what is Christ doing in our lives because we are missing out on opportunities and things that God has planned for us, but we are so busy in the, in, in the morning, morning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G process, that we can't see the opportunities that he's given us. God wants us to be just as prosperous as they are. But because we know God and we are learning all about the humility of being a child of God and everything else, Sometimes we don't feel like we're worthy. Sometimes we don't feel like that opportunity is really for us. You know, when God wants us up there, he wants us up to be the heads of everything. That's the way God would have it. But we have to start with ourselves and, and start to understanding why we are so, what's holding ourselves down. And, and, and we will use this one thing all the time, you know, sin is keeping me from what God has for me. Brothers and sisters, you're a child of God. And Paul has great things to say about it, and I want to bring that to you this morning. But before we go there, I want you to turn to 1 John, and I want you to mark this one real good. 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. And verse 9. And every time you get to feeling 
sorry for yourself or feeling like what you are doing, even though it's bad in life, is what's keeping you down, I'm going to show you something. I, I want to show you something that God is saying to us as, as children of faith. In, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, you, you, you see these words. Whosoever, whosoever is born of God doeth not commit sin. For his seed, whose seed? God, Jesus Christ, remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Now, I'm talking spiritually. I'm not, I'm not wanting you to go out all boastful and I'm sending up a storm. I'm a Christian, so I'm all right and cool and whatever. You know, God, God says, matter of fact, Paul says uh, to these people that actually made those comments like that, he says, God forbid. Paul was trying to tell them where there's sin, there's grace, God's grace. And, and, and where there's more sin, he says, grace abound much more. And so this dumb disciple said to him, he says, well, if that's the case, then I'm going to go and just send up a storm. I'm going to have all kinds of fun since grace is going to overrule my sin. And Paul says, God forbid. God forbid. See, because the issue comes if you are pra practicing sin, if, if you are uh, trying to think of the word, uh, don't worry about that. If you're trying to purposely go commit sins, then there's an issue. If there's no guilt in your conscience at all when you commit the sin, and now since you know that God's grace aboundeth much more, I'm going to go out and just sin up a storm, then there's something wrong with your salvation. Because his seed, God's seed, the son of the Lord Jesus Christ, is not dwelling in you. Because if he's dwelling in you, his Holy Spirit will be tearing your conscience up. So if that's where you find yourself, then you need to revisit the cross. You need to hear some salvation messages, if that be your case. But the, the majority, but, but, but there, there are those of us that, that think that sin is, is, is what's keeping us from the enjoyment that God has for us in our life. It is not sin necessarily. Sin does bring grief in our lives, but God gives us a way out, confessing it to him, not to anybody else, to him. When we sin, God says to us in 1 John again, chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, well, really 8, 9 and 10, he says to us that what I want to hear from you is confession. I want you to hear what I'm telling you. And the word that goes there for the word of confession, homo logos, is the Greek word that's there. Homo means the same as. Logos, word, so he is saying to, to, to confess is to agree using the same words as God is using to your spirit. If you are a homonger, you don't say, Lord, I, I just like women. No, that ain't the problem. All men should be lacking women. And should not be praying for God to take that away. That's a blessing God has given you. You know, say what God is saying to you. You, 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 you are, <laughs> I don't need to be, be, I don't need to be, there are children here. Say what God is saying to, to you when you're in your prayer life. So that your mind can hear what the issue is. And when the mind finally starts to hearing how bad you are and what you're doing, then the body, the flesh, will start to doing something better about it. But if the mind does not agree with the mind of Christ and you're confessing, it's not going to say anything. But if you keep hearing that you are a thief, or that you are just no good, well, no, that, that's, a, 
Don't, don't use that because that, that's a big general statement. God wants you to be specific in why you're no good in your secret clause. Nobody else is hearing it. Be honest with him. Close the door and cry out to him and repeat to him exactly what he is laying on your heart and God will forgive you. He will lift that burden off of you and you will enjoy a life that he's intended for you to have. Don't let the lie that Satan is throwing at you that because you are sinning, then you have lost your salvation and there's no hope for you. You're just as no good as the rest of them out there because God says differently. Let's look at our lesson today. Dead to the power of sin. Who is dead to the power of sin? Yes, you are children of God. Yes, you are dead to sin. You are dead specifically to the power of sin. That's what you're dead to, is to the power of sin. Sin corrupts and sin kills, but it does not corrupt nor kill us anymore because we have been redeemed and we have been justified, which means that God has declared us righteous God has declared that. And what God has declared, no man can change. No matter how you start to backsliding, as we would say, no matter how you, you, you get wayward in your actions, there is always a lifeline that's attached to you. And that lifeline is the Holy Spirit. Because God says, I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. So no matter how bad or raggedy you get out there, there is that lifeline that will drag you back to where you're supposed to be. And you need to know that so that you won't get out there and get to wondering and falling apart and say, I don't, they don't need me to go to church no more because I've done so much stuff until I don't know whether God can even forgive me. But even past that, my conscience is so heavy, I can't even, you know. No, that's, that, that's a lie of Satan. And God wants you to know today that we are dead to the power of sin that we commit in our lives. We all do. We all commit sins in our lives. Don't, don't get past that. Ain't nobody in here righteous. The pastor is worse than you all are probably. Don't think that nobody is above anybody. Jesus sees us all in the same place as creatures in need of salvation. And so we stand firm in the fact that the difference between us is that we are sinners that have been redeemed. We are sinners that have been redeemed. And because we have been redeemed, sin no longer has a control over us. No longer. Since we have died with Jesus in his resurrection, we are now alive with him through his resurrection. We really died to him in his crucifixion. We died with him spiritually when he died on the cross. Those of us who received Jesus and the pardon of their sin, what Jesus did at Calvary, he hands to us. So we don't have to do that. But the Bible says that we died with him. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse, uh, verse, verse, verse 20. Verse 20. And, it, and it, it says there that... Uh, we, are, we have been crucified with Christ, but nevertheless, we live. We are alive. We have been crucified with him, but nevertheless, we are alive. But the finishing of that text says to us that because we are alive and we are a child of Christ, and we've been crucified him, something different has happened. That, that the Son of God, that Jesus Christ, is the one now who's living within us. And it is his faith then that's working in us that keeps us from being destroyed by sin. We cannot be destroyed by sin because he lives within us. And he is greater than any sin that there is. But he wants us to know that and to trust that and to believe that. 
And when we do, we become stronger believers. We become stronger Christians. We are able to do what Christ has encouraged us to do. Because we died and was buried with Christ, we have been set free from sin. I know you've heard that over and over and over, and you've read the book of Romans probably over and over and over, but there is a truth that takes a while to enter our spirits, and that we are free. We are free from sin. We're free. Even though we are committing sin, God says that you have an advocate who is in heaven, that whenever you do sin, that he plead your case to the Father. And as he plead the, the case, according to the Bible, he pleads his own blood. He is saying, my blood covers that young man. My blood covers that young lady. Yes, it appears that it's sin that's going on, but the veil that is placed there is the veil of blood. And that, that shields God from being able to see what we are doing and what God sees is the veil of Jesus that's over every single one of us. I've told y'all before, one of the reasons that I wear a robe is not the fact of to sweat my, keep from sweating my suits out, but the main reason that I do it is because it represents the covering that Jesus is giving and he's doing it not only to the, to the preacher, but to all of you. Jesus says, give me your coat, which is full of sins. All the ones you, you have committed, all the ones that you are committing, and all the ones you will commit. Give me your coat, and I will give you a coat of righteousness, a coat of colors. And that's the coat that we wear around is the coat of righteousness of Christ. So even though we do commit sins occasionally, we are still children of God because when God looks at us, he sees that covering. He sees what Christ has, what Christ is, all of what Christ is, the righteousness of Christ, the redemption that he brought for all of us. That's what he sees. That's why you remain precious in his sight. You know, it's hard to understand why, you know, when you're knowing yourself personally that you're still doing some things you shouldn't be doing. How is that Christ can still be loving me? Because you cannot be seen spiritually for what you're doing. That's a beautiful thing, my brothers and sisters. We are covered. We are covered by the grace of God, his grace, not because we merited it, not because we worked for it, not because we are so good that we deserve it. It's because of his grace. It's because of his love. It's because he wants for us to be in that way. We have been freed to live our lives freely as believers in Christ. We have been freed to do that. So recognize the fact that John says that God has said to him, as he wrote it down, that we can no longer, as far as he seeing us, we can no longer sin because he lives within us. Now, we, we can understand that that is to be received by faith. We can understand why that's the case, but that is the case. And we are not capable of sinning because we are sin free in the sight of God. So confess the sins that you do, thank God that you have a covering and, and bless him and, and, and do what you can to do better, but don't let the sin that's in your life or that you're committing block you from the love of the Lord Jesus Christ because that's what happens to a lot of Christians. That's why a lot of Christians use this term, well, I've backslidden. Well, in fact, you can't backslide. You can't backslide as a child of God. It may appear from the physical eye, but from the spiritual eye of God, no, you're still a child of God. If you have gone back to the hog pen eating hog husks, or corn, and slop, all that says to God is that my child is in the hog pen and he needs to come out. 
He never refuses who you are because you're in the midst of sin. You are dead to the power of sin. Three things, and I'll be, be through with it. Three things. Um, first one, we are united in death with the Lord Jesus Christ. We are united in his death. The second thing is, when we died, we were set free. See, spiritually, we died. That's why we can say that, you know, we were included in the death of Jesus, spiritually. And since we were included in the death of Jesus, spiritually, then we were set free from sin. Think of what God is trying to say to us. He is saying, if you are dead, if you are spiritually dead, how can a dead man sin? Think, think through what God is trying to say here to us. He is saying that we are spiritually dead with Christ. And so this old man, this old man that the scripture is talking about, this old man that we still lug around, this old man is, is, is not going to destroy or keep us from the glory of God. Because we who are God's children are dead to sin. So sin can be there pushing this dead something, but it don't respond. We're talking spiritually now. And that's what God is trying to get you to see so that you'll stop being disencouraged. Stop being beat on and confused with Satan and oh you ain't a child of God because you're doing so bad you know you need to join some other group you need to become a Muslim because we pray six times a day and you know and I often confuse my my administrative assistant I won't call her name you know but this this lady I'm telling you she is she is so sweet she has an alarm on her watch and it goes off, I don't know, almost say six times a day. And I said, Cheryl, you know, why you got, I call her name then. <laughs> I said, why you got this going off all this time? She said, cause the world is so bad, it just reminds me it's time to pray. <laughs> and she takes a few moments and pray, and I'm saying, bless her heart, she's doing better than me. She's doing better than what I'm doing. You know? But God has freed us to where we can do that and do it freely if that's where our heart is lead, leading us. See, because believe it or not, when you worship God, when you're away from the church, you feel guilty about it because you haven't recognized how free you are. How many of us will go just, just boldly in the lunchroom at work and start to pray before you eat your food? Okay, we got one or two. I see two hands. Okay. But the rest of you like me. You look around, you know, thank you, Jesus, for what you're giving me. Amen. And go to Eden, you know. No example to anyone that's looking on that there's someone special that I'm lifting up. And that I'm giving praise to the fact that I am first able to eat. And second, he's supplied a substance for me to eat. It's not just an automatic thing. You, it ain't just automatically that that's going to be the thing. You know, that, you know, as you get older, you'll find out that, that sometimes you just don't, don't eat. You don't want to eat. You don't have an appetite to you know, you, you, you find yourself in that way and you recognize that it becomes a blessing that God gives you the appetite or the blessing to even partake of something. We, we overlook that. But even that prayer is an important prayer. But we sometimes are ashamed to do it 
because of the others looking on, and that's the main reason why God wants us to do it, because there are others who are looking on. And we should be strengthened to be able to, to let people know that we are children of God. That's why it's important to understand we have been freed so that we can worship God, so we can praise God. Now, I'm not talking about getting up in the workplace and just getting crazy, pulling a text, you know, and then throwing a miniature Bible study before you sit down at your computer. I ain't talking about that. that that's, that's ridiculous. They ought to throw you off the job if you did some stuff like that. That's not what I'm talking about. Because Jesus says, as you go, make disciples. He didn't say preach to people. He didn't say go over there and try to shake salvation into somebody. He says, as you go, make disciples. Let your lifestyle demonstrate the fact that you belong to him. Yeah. And then the third thing is we are raised to new life. We are united with Christ in his death. Because of his death, we are freed from sin. And the ultimate purpose is so that we can be raised to new life, a life full of joy, a life knowing that I have a Savior. Isn't it wonderful to where when we get away from all the foolishness and the loudness that, and when we meditate on the fact that we are born again, that there's a freeness in our spirit, knowing that there's nothing that can, can take that joy away, that no matter what the situation in life comes, that that joy still exists, even to the point of God bringing a, a, a loved one home out of, away from us, out of our lives. That even in the midst of the great sorrow that comes from that, there is a, an abundance of joy in your heart that you can't understand. You know, you, you want to cry, you want to scream out. It feels like that's what you should do. But inwardly, there's a joy that's persistent in knowing that God is still working. Don't know why, don't know how, but God is in control. And that's what he wants us to do is to learn to trust him. And so looking at being the fact that we're, that we're united with him in death, we have been crucified with him. That's what the Bible is speaking about. When Christ died on the cross, we died with him. When we chose to become a child of God, when we are born again, when we chose Jesus to come into our lives, the, the spiritual thing that happens that we don't see, there's what's called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit does a, 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 a miracle work in our lives. And, and we don't, we, we really don't understand and we don't sometimes recognize when he does that. You know, but what he does is that he takes everything that's Equated to the, res to the crucifixion of Christ, his death on that cross, he renders it in our lives. What that means is that the effect or the draw of the old man, the old man is the old self, the one that always got us in trouble, or the one who knows where all the bones are buried, the one that was with us in the midnight when everybody else was fast asleep except us and somebody else doing what we ain't got no business doing. That's the old man. He knows about all of that and where all those bones are. But when we died with Christ, that connection to the old man is cut away. He no longer has control of our lives because what the, what the Holy Spirit does, he brings into us the new man, the one that is free, the one that has no connection to sin. As a matter of fact, part of what the old man what the new man is is the mind of Christ that comes into our lives all of a sudden we're able to think through things with the mind of Christ and not doing the same thing the way we did in old days old days says go up and slap that heifer you know the new man says no go 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 hug her and tell her that I love her you know, and then move on about your business. Now, that makes no sense to us, but it makes every bit of the sense to Christ, but because through that, we are able to start to 
making a disciple or cause someone to wonder what in the world is wrong with that lady. I know what I did to her. Why is she not attacking me back? And Christ gets the glory out of it because of your action. That's what the new man guides you to do rather than the old man telling you to do what you used to do in the process. Sin has lost its power in our lives. No longer. Yes, we, God don't want us to sin. He wants us to, to mature. There's a thing that's called sanctification, a growing process. Growing stronger and stronger. Yesterday we may, a, may commit this particular sin, but today we don't want to. Tomorrow, another one that we used to do, we don't want to. You know, day by day by day, we grow. And even if we slip, even if we go back, there's a couple of things. If we go back and grab an old sin that's been removed that you have walked away from, what you're going to find out, first thing, it's not as sweet as it used to be. I'm telling you, it ain't as sweet as it used to be. It has, it, it, it's, it's no longer enjoyable as it used to be. That's the first thing. But the second thing is because we're a child of God, and when we confess it, God removes it from our lives, from our conscience. And we are restored back in the process at the same level when we left it. We don't start again. Remember the ladder that Pastor M used to teach from? We don't start again at the bottom. God restores us at that same level and we continue growing. That's what happens when we have received the new man, when we have united ourselves with Christ in his, in his crucifixion. That's what the baptism demonstrates. I've died in Christ, buried, I'm raised from the dead to new life. That's what it represents. That's why us Baptists, we like to dunk. It shows it better. Sprinkling don't really show nothing, in my opinion. You know, but baptizing in water, full commercial, uh, immersion, shows the example, the death and the burial and the resurrection to new life. That's what Christ has, has given us. When we die with Christ, we were set free. Set free from the power of sin, not set free from sin. Sin is going to always be around us. If it was dependent on our salvation, that every sin that we ever commit is, is confessed and God forgiven, there's a whole bunch of Christians that's going to hell. Because when you're on your deathbed, there's a whole lot of sins that you've committed that you don't forgot you've done, and you haven't asked God for any kind of uh, forgiveness. You know, and if that was the case, then I'm sorry, sister, brother, you're on your way to hell. But that's not what God, that's not what God looks at. God looks at the finished work of his son Jesus and our receiving, believing that by his death, his burial, and his resurrection, we have the new man. We have been, we have become new like Christ. That's what God looks at. And, and even though you're the worst sinner in this world on your deathbed, God still is reckoning you into his presence. We don't understand why God can be so graceful, but he is. He is so loving and so forgiving and so graceful. But we have a part, my brothers and sisters. In this life, he wants us to be examples for him. So his concern is, is how we deal with the fact of sin in our lives. He wants us to confess it, to recognize that he is faithful and just to forgive it, and to restore us as strong as we ever were in his presence, and moving along and allowing our life to flourish, allowing the light that is his to be shown in our lives. That's what he wants. And then if, if that happens, we are raised to new life. We're no longer dead, but alive to God. We're no longer left in the grave. We're no longer left in the water. We are raised to new life. 
Baptism demonstrates. It doesn't do that for us. Baptism does nothing for us. But it demonstrates what, what the Holy Spirit has done in our lives. He has done all the work. Once we are dead in sins, we are free from that power. And that's what I want you to get to understand. We're talking about the power that sin has in your life. Sin has the power to destroy a marriage. Sin has a power to destroy relationships. It has a, the power to destroy your job or your position on a job, to destroy your life, to destroy your testimony, destroy everything about you. That's what it will do if you left it undealt with. But God gave us a way out. Because of the death, burial, and resurrection of his son Jesus, we have been given the right, the privilege to come to him to confess our sins. First John, again, chapter 1, verses 8, 9, and 10. To confess our sins, talk to God, let him know what we recognize for the sin that we're committed. And God is gracious to forgive us. And he says in the scriptures as well that when he forgives, he moves that sin as far from you as the east is from the west, never to be recognized or seen again. There's no way that the east will ever touch the west. And so God says that it will never come again into my presence. I will forgive it and forget it. And you are free to continue looking like my son Jesus, being profitable to the kingdom and letting others know that there's a joy in being a child of God. That's what it means to be dead to the power of sin in your lives. I pray that we take that with us as we go and recognize that there's joy. Go with laughter. Even though you may have sins that your conscience is worrying you about, just go to God in prayer and confession, and I'm going to tell you something. You'll see a real lifting on the other side of that, recognizing that he's forgiven you. Because Jesus did die for us on Calvary's cross over 2,000 years ago. He died on that cross with our sins upon him. That's why the Bible says we died with him, because he took all of our sins that you're worrying about, he took them and placed them upon himself and died on Calvary's cross to pay the penalty for those sins. Those sins that you're committing right now have no value in heaven because it's already been paid for. The only value it has is if you don't cash the check. So, so what does that mean? If you don't receive Jesus in the pardon of your sins, even though he has paid for those sins, that money remains in the bank and is never, never, never taken out. So if that be you, I pray that you would give God the opportunity to touch your lives and to be able to let the Holy Spirit give you a new life in Christ to where death, where sin, has no power in your life. You are dead to the power of sin. You need to know that, brothers and sisters. You need to let that just churn in your heart and stop feeling all broken down, stop feeling defeated by the evil one. He has no power over you, none. Satan has no power over you. The only power that God has given him is the power in controlling the world system. You none. Only what you let him have. So let us stand. And the invitation is simply, if God is touching your heart right now, that through the declaration and power of the gospel, through the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, through that declaration that God has made and Jesus has done, power has been given to you for salvation. Paul writes in Romans chapter 1 that the gospel 
is the power unto salvation. There is no other way to God but through the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If that be you today, why don't you come down, edify the church in allowing them to, to be a brother and sister with you. That's what it means. Coming down the aisle doesn't save. But what it does, it, it makes us fellowship together to keep us all together in, in the line with Christ. What does that mean? That means that when I sidestep or mess up or you see me doing something I've got no business, it is upon you as another brother or sister to say, hey, Brother Gregory, get back in line. You know, I, I see what you're doing. We make, it, we make each other accountable to each other. That's what it means when you come down the aisle. Also, if you want to be a part of this church, coming down the aisle means that we recognize so that we can put you on the books of the church. So that's the only two reasons of coming down the aisle. No salvation is attached to it. Devils have come down the aisle, shook my hand, got their names on the book, and still got their reservation in hell. You know, Choosing Jesus as your Lord and Savior is the only way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. I say yes, Lord, yes, to your trust in and obey. When your spirit speaks to me, with my whole heart I'll agree. get some from that that powerful sermon today amen so you ain't got to go jump off the bridge now the Lord love you and he's covering you amen I love to hear our pastor teach and preach he ain't never like hooping he don't like you to hoop he said, hoop and just exercise. You just go home tired. That's all it is. If I get, get you going and, and get you jumping and you think that's salvation, you think you're really catching the Holy Ghost. Catching. Key word. Catching. Man. If you being taught the word of God, you already know you can't catch what's been given to you. Child, I caught the Holy Spirit today. Stop it. You don't shut up something. <laughs> it is. What do you say, Pastor? Not what you're going to do with it, Pastor. Say that you don't caught it. <laughs> you're going to let it go. <laughs> or, if you're back in your ways, you're going to sell it. <laughs> hey, thank you, Lord, for saving us. Amen. Amen. Now it's time for our worship and giving. Let us pray. Father, we come to you saying thank you. Lord, we thank you for laughter. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving us a pastor to teach and preach the word of God. Father, now it's time that we can come together and all and give you praise. We ask, Lord, that for those that don't have today, Lord, that you would bless them financially to have to give the next time. And, Father, let us give with abundantly love. We thank you. We love you. In Christ's name we say, amen. Thank you, Jesus.
Father, we thank you. We love you. Let it be for the better of your ministry and your kingdom. In Christ's name we say, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Good for me. Blessings and glory and honor. They all belong to you. Thank you, Jesus, for blessing me. We'll now have our acknowledgement of our visitor, Sister Raheem. Giving honor to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to Pastor Gregory, pulpit members and friends, good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Sister Alinda Rahim. At this time, we'd like to acknowledge our visitors. Are there any visitors visiting today? Will you please stand and give your name and church affiliation, please? Anyone? We're glad to have you. On behalf of the pastor and the St. Joseph family, we would like to thank you for worshiping with us today. We have been blessed by your presence here. And remember, this is the church where everybody is somebody and Jesus Christ is Lord, ever so in Black Bottom. Thank you for coming and please come again. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for coming today. Announcements. Great afternoon, everybody. Mm-hmm. To God be the glory, Pastor Pulpit, St. Joseph. Hey, y'all. Yes, All right, so I do not have anything outside of our brochure, um, but I do want to iterate for not just for you, but for um, streaming services. All righty, so we do have a church outing um, coming up this coming Thursday. At 7 p.m., it's pastor's anniversary at um, Mount Pleasant Missionary Baptist Church. The address for this um, church is 1300 Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard in Green Cove Spring, Florida, 32043. Um, We ask that if if you are um, available, please avail yourself and come support and can represent God and and St. Joseph. So thank you for that. The Deaconess Ministry is hosting Young Ladies Lock-In. This is upcoming uh, two weekends from now. I do not have great detail. I do know that our sister Jessica Austin, Sister Quinietta Warren, and I'm hoping Sister um, Jessica Simon has some insight, do you? Okay, all right, this, um, again, this is set for August the 31st. It is Young Ladies Lock-In. Please um, listen out for more information about it. It is for our girls between the ages of 7 and 18. The gist is, I believe, that we will stay over on that Saturday night into Sunday morning. That's the gist for the group for girls 7 to 18. So St. Joseph, this is something for our young ladies. If you have, please avail yourself. There will be more information for you by next weekend. Okay, all right. Um, Before you get to the next one, I want to ask what what is an elevated game night? Yeah, I'm asking. What what is an elevated game night? Huh? That's not happening at St. Joseph? Something different. Mm -mm, That's not, this is, um, the uh, elevated game night is something separate, of course, from what I just spoke on, the lock-in for the girls. We'll shoot craps in the elevator? No, praise his holy name. I was just going to, I was getting excited, Pastor. I'm Uh, like, on September the 28th of this year, between uh, 5 and 9 p.m., we're going to have our first game night. Is that right? Is that what it is, Pastor? Elevated game night. Elevated. Means to another level to me. How about that? What's up? Okay, now it kicks in. (laughs) Okay. I thought game. we were going to play bingo in the elevator or something. I didn't know. Yeah, we're going we gonna to step it up, game. Okay, we're going to step right. game night up. That's what it says to me, Pastor. Okay. That's all. That's all. Right. all. <laughs> but, yes, this game night is set. <laughs> oh, boy, I tell you. Don't do that to her. Yeah, you got an ignorant game? pastor, boy. Okay. I'm telling you. <laughs> that was September the 28th. Again, this game night between the hours of uh, 5 p.m. and 9 p.m. So this is very um, interesting. And you all are going to enjoy it. We're not talking about, we're talking about adults. 
enjoying them. Uh, I ain't talking about swinging, man. I'm talking. Uh, okay, yep. okay. You know, now you know we are, we are, we are people of eating, so we're okay. going to have something, I'm sure. We, mm -hmm. Listen out for more information on the game night as amen, well. Amen, amen. It's going to be enjoyable, trust uh, me. Yes, 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 yes. It's going to be fun. So okay. Trust me. Trust We trust you, Pastor. <laughs> we trust God right. in you. Trust God in you. <laughs> All right, St. Joseph. <laughs> there are a list of other services that um, here are here at St. Joseph on the weeknights. Please look over your um, brochure and um, consider if you have uh, time to volunteer or you have the young people that you could um, actually bring and let them participate. So I believe that's going to conclude with, uh, my announcements for today. So thank you for your time. God bless you. Thank you so much for keeping us abreast of all the stuff. I'm glad you cleared that up. I couldn't figure out what's going to be in the elevator. You know, elevated game night is, you know, you, ignorance is pitiful, isn't it? <laughs> it yeah, that's what I'm saying. It, it left, leaves your mind to wonder. No, no, I'm with you, sister. I'm with you. My mind is, see, that goes along with our sin problem. Our mind still carries us in places where we don't need to go. That's right. So I thank God for the ability to confess, get rid of it, and move on straight lines, you know. Amen. In a solemn, in a solemn thought now, a note just been passed to me that uh, uh, Brother Wal Walter Allen, uh, his brother, Lawrence A A Allen, passed away Saturday. So let's be in prayer for the Allen family, okay, that, uh, you know, he was... Uh, once a deacon here with St. Joseph, y'all, y'all remember him. Uh, his brother Lawrence a Adam, uh, Allen passed away, I think, this Saturday. Okay. All right. Those that are in contact with him, please uh, let us know what he's doing, and if there's something that we can do as uh, as a fellowship of St. Joseph. Amen. Amen. With that, is there anything else? Remember, we are dead to sin. Don't get out there and, you know, and just lose it because you think you done messed up and can't go back. You know, there is no sin that God will not forget. The only sin that he will not forgive, there's only one. The unforgivable sin. Do y'all know what that is? Huh? What is it? Okay, well, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, but... Blasphemy doesn't explain totally what that means. You know, getting down to the dirt, do you all know what that means? Unbelief. It means for us to refuse his presence in our life. Yeah, unbelief. 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 It's just one word, unbelief. Because unbelief, we will curse him, we will move him aside, we will render things to him evil that is not the truth. We will do all those things. That, that's the one thing that God will not forgive is our, our belief in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When we refuse him, because the Holy Spirit is the one who is doing the salvation, who is doing the work. When we refuse to believe and receive the finished work of Jesus, we have blocked out the Holy Spirit. We have said he's a liar. We have blasphemed him. And God will not forgive it. Amen? Forget this stuff about self-murder and all this kind of suicide and all that is not in the Bible. That is not a truth. There's, this is brought up by a specific uh, religion. And if y'all ever want to hear that, the teaching on that, I'll be more than happy to bring it to you. But trust the fact that God will believe, will, will, will uh, receive every sin that you have confessed to him that you have committed. Amen? I mean, be free, brothers and sisters. Leave out the day free in your spirit, knowing that God has done it all for us. Amen? Amen. Let us stand. Be blessed.
to him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory, majesty, dominion and power both now and forever and we all say I pray for you you pray for me and watch God change things 